All right, hello everyone and welcome. This video is going to uh, continue my review and supplement of chapter five of your textbook, which talks about short-term and working memory, okay? So, so far we have um, been focusing on uh, what's called the modal model. And so the modal model is basically um, kind of a compilation of many different module, models of memory um, that were all formulated during the uh, information processing approach era, which attempts to explain how the mind works um, in a way that's analogous to how a computer works. Right. So the modal model basically distinguishes between three different types of memory or three different uh, structural features, which are sensory memory, short term memory and long term memory. Um, and it also talks about different control processes which allow for information to be transmitted between each of the three stores. Right. So thus far we have focused, or um, I should say in my last video, we focused uh, exclusively on short-term memory. So just as a refresher, short-term memory refers to a mechanism that allows for or has the capacity for holding but not manipulating a small amount of information in the mind in an active and readily available state for a short period of time, right? So in the context of the modal model, we start out with uh, sensory memory, which uh, is basically a brief snapshot of all of the information coming in through our various sensory modalities. And then whatever we decide is important or whatever we focus our attention on, that information is going to be transmitted from sensory to short-term memory for additional processing, right? And similarly, according to the modal model, if we engage in maintenance rehearsal, whereby we repeat the information to ourselves over and over again, kind of like a broken record, then it's going to be encoded or transmitted into long-term memory um, and from long-term memory, if we retrieve something, it goes back into short-term memory, which contains all of the information in our current awareness or the information we're, that we're currently consciously aware of, right? So that's short-term memory. But it was quickly discovered by uh, various psychologists uh, this idea of short-term memory, as it's currently defined, or as it was defined in the previous slide, um, is lacking. Um, and that's because people are able to do uh, certain things that this model of short-term memory um, would suggest they're not able to do, right? So for example, and this is from your book, but suppose that I asked you to keep the numbers 7149 in your mind as you read the following passage, right? So as you read the following passage, keep 7149 in your mind, right? So the following passage, uh, badly reasoned that if short-term memory had a limited capacity, a uh, limited storage capacity of about the length of a telephone number, Filling up the storage capacity should make it difficult to do other tasks that also depend on short-term memory. But he found that participants could hold a short string of numbers in their memory while carrying out another task, such as reading or even solving a simple word problem. How are you doing this task? What are those numbers? What is the gist of what you just read? Right? Um, so very effortlessly, we're all able to recite those numbers, right, 7149, while also understanding the basic meaning of this passage. Uh, 
Okay, but according to Atkinson and Schifrin's modal model, it should only be possible to perform one of these tasks as one of those tasks would occupy the entirety of our short-term memory store, right? Remember, according to George Miller, we can store between five and nine units of information and more contemporary research suggests that we can only hold four units of information at a time, right? So it shouldn't be possible for us to hold four numbers in mind while also doing something even more complex like reading or solving a simple word problem, right? Okay, but when Alan Badley and other cognitive psychologists did experiments similar to the demonstration that we just worked through, um, they found that participants were very easily able to read a passage or solve a problem and also retain those numbers in their short-term memory. Similarly, if I were to ask you to multiply 43 times 6 in your head, Chances are you would go through the following sequence, right? Visualize 43 times six in your mind. Multiply three times six, that first column of numbers and get 18. Hold eight in your memory while carrying the one over to the four. Multiply six times four to get 24. Add the carried one to the 24. Place the 25 next to the 8 and get the answer of 258. Right? But even if you didn't solve the problem in exactly that same way, right, it's easy to see that this calculation involves both storage of information and also active processes occurring at the same time. Right? So not only are you storing the information temporarily or holding it in your mind, you're also manipulating the information in some way, or you are enacting various mental processes on the information as you're holding it in mind. Right? So if only storage were involved, the problem could not be solved, right? Because there are other ways to do this calculation, but whatever method you choose is going to involve both holding information in your memory in real time and processing or manipulating that information. Okay, so working memory, unlike short-term memory, is a limited capacity system for temporary storage and manipulation of information. It is involved in complex tasks such as comprehension, learning, and reasoning. Okay, so working memory is different than short-term memory uh, because it involves while short-term memory only involves holding information in mind for a brief period of time, okay, working memory involves more than that, okay? Working memory is going to involve uh, the processing and manipulation of information, right? You're executing various cognitive commands on the information while holding it in mind, right? So working memory is concerned with the processing and manipulation of information that occurs doing, during complex cognition, like mental arithmetic, or um, simply doing more than one task at once. So the working memory model is going to attempt to explain what we just talked about or what I just showed you, which is the dynamic processes involved in cognition, such as understanding language and doing math problems. And also it ex it's going to attempt to explain the fact that people can carry out more than one task simultaneously without overtaxing their memory system. Okay, so it consists of separate components, okay? Or it consists of a number of components that can function independently of each other. 
So arguably the most famous working memory model was proposed by Badley and Hitch in 1974, and it's comprised of three components. So first we have the phonological loop. So the phonological loop consists of two components. So it consists of the phonological store, which has a limited capacity and holds information for only a few seconds, and the articulatory rehearsal process, which is responsible for the rehearsal that keeps items in the phonological store from decaying or being forgotten. Right? So just like according to the modal model, our short-term memory has a maintenance, re a maintenance rehearsal mechanism or control process to keep information in short-term memory, the phonological store is going to hold verbal and auditory information, and the articulatory rehearsal mechanism, or the ARM, is going to be responsible for enacting that active rehearsal process or that maintenance rehearsal process. Um, and that's going to keep information uh, that's currently in the phonological store from being forgotten, right? Um, so anytime that you're trying to remember any verbal or auditory information, such as a person's uh, phone number or what your cognitive psychology professor is telling you in a lecture video, that information is going to be stored by the phonological store um, and rehearsed by the articulatory rehearsal mechanism. And collectively, the phonological store and the articulatory rehearsal mechanism make up what a structure known as, or a mechanism known as, the phonological loop. Okay, next we have the visual spatial sketch pad. So the visio spatial sketch pad holds visual and spatial information, shocking. So whenever you form a picture in your mind or do tasks like solving a puzzle or finding your way around campus, Okay, you're using your visual spatial sketch pad. Okay, and as the diagram suggests, right, both the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad are attached to a third mechanism known as the central executive. Okay, so the central executive is where uh, as your book says, the major work of working memory occurs. So the central executive is going to be responsible for um, pulling information from long-term memory and also coordinating the activity of the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad by focusing on specific parts of a task and deciding how to divide your attention between different tasks. So that's why the central executive is often referred to as the traffic cop of the working memory system. So let's go ahead and look at a nice diagram that your book has. So in this hypothetical situation, right, you are driving in an unfamiliar city, right? So you've never been to this particular town before, and you decide that you want to enjoy a nice meal at, an, at a restaurant, right, that you've never been to before. So as you're driving, your friend is reading you directions to get to the restaurant, okay? And you guys are also listening to talk radio, right? So as you are attempting to drive and also listen to directions, right? Your working memory is doing different things, right? So your phonological loop is paying attention to the directions as you hear them, 
um, as your friend is speaking them and you hear them, that auditory or verbal information is being um, is being held or being processed by the phonological loop. Uh, as you are attempting to visualize your surroundings, right? And as you are attempting to attempting to um, visualize your surroundings and create a mental map, if you will, um, of the streets leading to the restaurant, okay, that information is going to be processed by your visual spatial sketch pad, okay? And while you are doing that, your central executive is going to be coordinating your attention between the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad and also combining this information together, okay? And lastly, your central executive is gonna help you ignore or filter out uh, the incoming information or the incoming messages from the radio so that they don't distract you from hearing the directions, right? So again, the uh, sound of your friend's voice reading you the directions, that information is going to be stored in your phonological loop. Uh, the mental map that you uh, conjure up as you are visualizing the streets leading to the restaurant is going to be held in your visual spatial sketch pad. And your uh, central executive is gonna be responsible for coordinating your attention between those two systems, combining the information in each of those two systems, and also helping you to ignore extraneous information from the car radio, okay? All right, so this concludes our um, very quick review of working memory. Um, so in my next video, or in my next series of videos, I should say, um, I'm going to go over um, evidence, experimental evidence that uniquely supports the existence of each of these components of working memory, right? So there are a number of experimental phenomena or scientific results that illustrate how the phonological loop deals with auditory and verbal information, how the visual spatial sketch pad deals with visual spatial information, um, and how the central executive uses attention to coordinate the two uh, and integrate information from the two and ignore irrelevant information. Okay, so in my next three videos, we're going to take a closer look at the phonological loop, the visual spatial sketch pad, and the central executive, and all of the evidence that seems to support this Badley and Hitch model of working memory. All right, all right, so I'll see you guys in my next video.